And thanks for the introduction. Um, I was actually given this title, um, Mind Blowing Ideas and Cool Concepts. I think even the word was crazy originally in the, uh, in the title. Um, I, I, I don't think, I mean, that's really a challenge to cover mind blowing ideas and crazy uh, uh, things. But I think it's uh, appropriate because what has happened over the last 20 to 30 years is that biology and the knowledge in biology has, has really exploded. And it's really at a pace which is almost uh, impossible to cope with, which then of course open up for completely new concepts and new perspectives. So it's a good timing to have a, a, a discussion around this. So let's start with just setting the scene um, <clears throat> with, um, with this. So it's actually so that today uh, serious scientists very clearly believe that we are on a road to eternal life. That's kind of where the new biology has put some people, that they have a belief that we are on our way to eternal life. You see, for instance, Google's chief futurist, Ray Kurzweil, he wrote a book that was very much spoken about. You may have heard about Aubrey de Grey. He started a foundation that is studying aging. Is this crazy or is it realistic? That's something we may discuss after uh, over the drinks. It's close to philosophy. But maybe then looking at stuff where we have been involved that kind of explain the process of what we are doing, which is venture capital to invest in innovation and science to secure that these innovations are actually brought all the way to, to, to patients. But still, mind-blowing ideas. I would like to take you through two case studies. The first one is actually from our own portfolio, the company where I was involved. But since I'm a modest guy, the second case will not be from our own portfolio. But hopefully both these cases will kind of illustrate what I mean by mind-blowing ideas, but the, where it's actually possible that these mind-blowing ideas becomes new therapies and be used with patients. So I met with a scientist in Paris in a small office. He's a thoracic surgeon. He brought his technician, and this is what they actually told me they were going to actually completely change, which at that time was open heart surgery, heart-lung machine, open up the heart when you are to replace an aortic valve. Long rehabilitation period, enormously costly and quite risky for patients. Replace this by putting the valve at the tip of a catheter, introduce the catheter in the groin vessel, put it up to the heart and let it thereby replace and give it a new. It's a crazy idea. Let's see. As patients with severe aortic stenosis. In the procedure, a physician makes a small incision and inserts the device, which is less than one quarter of an inch wide, into the artery in the leg. It is then guided through the arteries to the site of the narrowed aortic valve in the heart. Its small delivery system makes it possible to treat patients with a vascular system that is small or difficult to navigate. Once in place, the core valve system's self-expanding frame enables physicians to deploy it in a controlled manner, allowing for accurate placement. Here the device expands and takes over the original valve's function to ensure that oxygen-rich blood flows efficiently out of the heart and circulates throughout the rest of the body. The catheter is then removed from the patient's body and the incision in the groin is closed. Patients who are interested in learning more about this minimally invasive treatment option can visit www. So, <clears throat> this patient a day after is up and walking. The enormous impact for patients, hospital costs and society. We sold the company to Medtronic and that's why this is a Medtronic uh, movie. Uh, but it was venture-backed all the way until Medtronic bought it. Let's look at another one, which I think is kind of a holy grail. We all know that our own endogenous immune system is always active. It's fighting viruses, it's fighting bacteria, it's also fighting cells that are slightly disorganized and may turn into tumors. So the immune system is immediately there to kill it. But you all know that sometimes that does not work, the tumor takes over. So, is it possible that we can activate our own immune system to combat cancer? And it has been mentioned already by Ron that immune oncology is a new area. 
So how was this? Well, it was really academic research back in the US. James Allison proved this concept with a new, where they actually took away the break of the immune system and showed that by taking away the break of the immune system, you had in vivo data in mice where you could clearly see that you could improve tumor killing. This uh, findings uh, was licensed by Medarex at the time a small biotech company, further developed and then later, actually the company that Leif mentioned, BMS, Bristol Myers Squibb, acquired Medarex and the product was approved in 2011. Today it's definitely more than one billion <coughs> US dollar drug and James Allison, as you can see, was rewarded the Nobel Prize uh, in Stockholm for his findings. Now, what does we mean then by a true impact for patients? These products actually, they are called checkpoint inhibitors. What I show in this slide here is the classical way in oncology is called the Kaplan-Meier curve, where we have patient number of patients or percentage of survivors and here is the time, it's up until 48 months. This is a disease, malignant melanoma with metastasis. When I was a medical student, which is a long time ago, but even 20 years ago, if you had malignant melanoma with metastasis, that was your death sentence. There was nothing you can do. These patients now with a combination of checkpoint inhibitors as you can see, almost 40 to 50 percent have an overall survival, which is for many, many years. And even 20 to 30 percent of these patients are today considered cured. So it's a true uh, <coughs> explosion of new findings. These are two examples. But why do I show this? Well, I show it because biology is, for the moment, dramatically improving. But all of these uh, these two examples are also venture-backed small companies taking academic research, build small companies, secure venture backing, and then move the development of the products all the way to the patient. And then in these two cases, the smaller companies have been bought by larger companies, and that's the nice harmony today between smaller companies and larger companies. Uh, and we will look a little bit more on this uh, later on. So what is HealthCap? HealthCap is a venture um, capital company, I mentioned, based in Stockholm. We invest globally. We were founded back in 96. And these are just a few summary uh, points. Uh, we have made more than 100 investments. Our companies have taken 25 uh, pharmaceutical products to the market. Uh, and we also now, a days, talk about unicorns. They used to be the tech guys that talked about unicorns. It's important to say that life science companies can also be billion market cap companies, and we have developed at least seven of these unicorns. What and what is it that we do, and what is our driving here? <clears throat> and I was asked also to talk about the venture model and how it has developed over the years. Life science is a big area, and we started out as many venture capital firms in the life science space to invest in basically anything in life science. But over the years, we have gradually narrowed down this. Started with focusing on therapeutics, which is one area within life science. Today, we have narrowed it down even further to talk about precise medicine. And what is precise medicine? And why does that fit the venture model? Well, for us, precise precision medicine is breakthrough therapies. Therapies that really makes a difference and fulfill an unmet medical need. But the most important thing for us, being scientists and medical doctors, is that we go for a well-understood biology when it comes to disease mechanisms. But not only to understand the underlying disease, it's also important to understand the product's mechanism of action and how that relates to the disease mechanism. And that together form really precision medicine or what some people talk about targeted medicine. Leif mentioned it as well. That's the way you can secure that you include the correct patients, the right patients into your clinical trials. Why does this fit the venture model? Well, it actually gives you a much better risk reward profile. 
Here we illustrate it with something called orphan drugs. We, we should not spend too much time on definition of that. It's a regulatory definition, meaning that you have a defined patient population. But as you can see here, if we compare orphan drug versus non-orphan drugs, we have shorter development time, you have a less expensive clinical trials, meaning that a venture-backed company can actually bring the product all the way to the market themselves. You make yourself independent of big pharma decision-making, whether or not they like the product or not, and you make yourself independent whether or not there is an IPO window, which is one way to, to raise public money or even uh, an exit. Here we control our own destiny. And the combination of this leads to a lower development risk. All of this good risk reward profile fitting the venture model. <clears throat> Looking then at the venture model as such, I'm trying to illustrate in this slide where we over the years have invested roughly 1 billion euro in, as I showed you, more than 100 companies. But the leverage of this model is that our companies then and we build venture syndicates. So other companies like ourselves also invest in our companies, meaning that our one billion became seven billion in the way our companies raised further money. That money allow us to put and bring products through the development chain, building further value. So the total value created from that first billion is today 42 billion. That's how we would like to describe the venture model. Then what we bring to the table is not only money, hopefully, but of course we work actively in the company. We sit on boards, we recruit management, we work with strategy, we work in the financing. That's kind of how we would like to illustrate the venture model in life science. We talk about innovation. <clears throat> this is just one way to illustrate the shift from maybe the more uh, uh, classical type of pharmaceutical companies to the more <coughs> companies that started out as biotech companies. And this is just looking at market cap development. These are only US-based companies, I should say, Leif. So that's why AstraZeneca is not on here. But as you can see, the market cap has actually doubled over the last decade. And we argue that this is really due to innovation innovative drugs, new, completely new treatments for patients. So where does then the innovation come from? And looking at new approved drugs by FDA in the US, you can see that 66% of the newly approved products between 2009 to 2018 comes from smaller biopharma. And now I talk about the or where they originate. They may be sold and commercialized by the larger companies, but this is looking at the origin for these innovative products. So we argue that innovation actually has shifted to small biopharma. And again, precision medicine, which is one driver for this, fits venture capital. So we believe venture capital today is very much a success in life science based on that we can go with biology for precise medicine and bring novel products to the market. So, last slide just to summarize. Um, we are very proud to say that our companies bring new products to the market, that we treat patients with innovative new treatments, and we also bring medtech products. I'm a physician and scientist myself, that's my background. I find it extremely satisfying that we can combine this financial model with the scientific driven model. And that's why we, with some pride, say that we're doing well by doing good. So thank you very much. Thank you.